So welcome to this multi-stakeholder dialogue on internet platforms, sexual content and child protection. My name is Jeremy Malcolm. I'm the Executive Director of Prostasia Foundation. Here are uh, some background rules for today. You're welcome to tweet and blog. Our hashtag, as you can see, is sex content dialogue. However, uh, this meeting is being held under the Chatham House rule, which means that uh, although you're allowed to um, uh, mention anything that's uh, said in here, you're not allowed to attribute it. The exception is for the presenters, because the presenters who are up front here um, with their presentations um, are, are fine with that. But for questions from the audience, for our discussions in the afternoon, um, please don't attribute anything that's said to anyone in particular, whether that's an individual or a company. Um, and the reason for that is just so that we can speak freely and so we don't have to worry about crossing particular into particular taboo topics, for example, that might be controversial if it was attributed to you. Um, for the same reason, uh, if you're going to be taking photos, um, photos of the presenters are fine, but photos of the other participants, please make sure you get their permission first. Um, help yourself to, as you've been doing, to coffee, tea, sodas and snacks. Thanks for Patreon for giving us this space and, uh, and making that available to us. And uh, please stay until the end if you can, because we are going to be doing some group work at the end, which is going to be probably the most important part of the day. Um, so it'd be great to have you there for that. So without any further ado, why are we here? So uh, we're here because we care about protecting children, um, but we can protect children in, in ways that are, are uh, effective or that are ineffective and uh, that are harmful to uh, other people in society. So what we've found is that um, a lot of the approaches that we've been taking towards child protection both haven't been effective, A, and B, have been harmful um, to other, pop other people and to children themselves in a lot of cases. Um, so we're finding in particular that uh, online speech about sex is being over restricted on the justification of child protection, but which really isn't having that effect. Um, in fact, sometimes it's doing the opposite. Sometimes it's actually hurting the people that it's meant to be protecting. Um, and so uh, what we're trying to do here today is to discuss ways in which we can take a more nuanced approach to content moderation and censorship that both protects children but also upholds freedom of speech because we can't just do one thing, we have to do both. Um, so the process that we're gonna be engaged in today is uh, one of multi-stakeholder deliberation. What that basically means is that we're going to have um, uh, um, firstly background briefings in the morning so that we're all on the same page. And then in the afternoon, we're gonna try and deliberate on some concrete problems um, in a way that's really not trying to talk about our own private interests, but to talk about the public interest. And to do that, everyone is gonna be respected as an equal participant, and we're all gonna try and see um, if we can uh, approach these problems from a new angle based on the information that we've heard from the presenters in the morning. And this process tends to lead to a more informed, more inclusive response um, than you might have, uh, uh, th than we tend to, to approach these problems with. Um, so here are the panelists that we're going to be hearing from, uh, and there's some more detailed biographies of those in the background paper, if you would like to check them out. Uh, the first of them, Andrew Putterfat, is unable to be here in person, as you'll hear from him. Um, he's undergoing some surgery at the moment. Um, however, we do have a video from him, which I'm going to play. Um, and uh, so why don't I do that right now? This is a conversation that I had with Andrew just a couple of days ago. Um, so uh, Andrew Putterfat is the chair of the Internet Watch Foundation. For those who are not familiar with the Internet Watch Foundation, they are the um, organization, they're a charity in the United Kingdom and their responsibility is to um, categorize uh, images into um, uh, child exploitation images of various kinds. And he'll tell you more about that in the talk. So uh, without any further ado, let's hear from Andrew. So, Andrew, thank you very much for joining us for this chat and uh, also joining us remotely at our multi-stakeholder dialogue. Yeah. yeah, sorry I couldn't be at the meeting. I have a slight medical procedure to go through, nothing serious, but um, I'll be there. So I'm sorry about that. No worries. Well, best, best wishes for that procedure. Now, uh, you and I have uh, collaborated for a number of years uh, since before either of us was directly involved in the child protection space. And can I just say that your path in becoming chair of the Internet Watch Foundation has been personally quite inspirational to me because it showed that really we're all on the same side, that the human rights uh, community and the child protection community really need to be in this together. 
Um, do, do you have any thoughts on that? What what drew you into this space? It, it's exactly that, Jeremy. I, I, what I've noticed over the years, and I'm sure it's true for you, <coughs> is that the child protection and the safety community in general, people concerned with safety, just meet in a different place from the people concerned. And because I think, you know, a declaration is something that's always inspired me, and there's a right to be free and safe as a, as a key human right in Article 3, I've always wondered, why can't we be in the same space thinking about things? So when the Internet Watch Foundation uh, chair post came up, um, I thought about it and thought, why don't I do this and go, and go to them and say explicitly, I'm a human rights person, I want to take this from a human rights angle, I believe passionately in freedom of expression, but I also believe in, in not exploiting small children. And I didn't know how they'd take it, but actually I had an incredibly positive feedback. They were really keen to have me as a candidate for the chair. And obviously, at the end of the day, I was appointed by the board. One of the things, you know, it's, it's really a small personal attempt to bridge that gap between people who worry about the, the kind of stuff that's online and people who want to defend the good stuff. And my view is, if we don't find the right way of defeating and dealing with uh, the bad stuff, the sewage, if you like, the ecosystem, we risk losing all the great things that the internet represents, all the positive va values and all the freedoms and openness and access to information and ideas that, that, it, that it's brought us. And I think we are at the moment where if we don't figure out how to deal with the sewage, like, it's going to put the whole atmosphere and lead governments, as they're already doing, down the path of let control and shut down because it's just liberated all the bad forces and it'll cause them to lose sight of all the positive things so that's that's been really my main in they say my main motivation i mean it's been a, a powerful motivation for me taking on this particular role so the internet watch foundation's uh, 2018 annual report was released quite recently and you wrote a preface to that report can you give us a few highlights from the report what are some of the most important takeaways I mean, I think the important takeaways are the volume, um, which for most people, we, you know, we don't see the content that involves children being abused because we're not, you've got to look for it to find it. You, it's very hard to stumble across it accidentally, even if you're using, you know, traditional pornographic websites. You need to make a positive step to do that. So the volume surprises me. It alarms me that there's so much increasing material of children under three which implies a very, very, uh, you, you know, a very difficult phenomenon for us to deal with. Um, and I suppose the third thing that occurred to me, and, and it's happened in my time as chair, that we're going to fix this by simply content and not addressing the men who want to access this content in the first place. And to me, the analogy is like the drugs war. You don't win the drugs war by suppressing the supply of drugs because you never can suppress the supply of drugs you can disrupt it you can make it more expensive you can create more penalties for people who are uh, promoting it or, or distributing it but you'll never eliminate it and i think one of the things that struck me is a lot of society's investment as is true across the whole criminal justice system is into the detection and punishment of offenders and hardly any of it is invested into the prevention of these crimes in the first place. So that's something now that I'm, you know, we're talking about as a foundation. I'm raising it with other organisations like us around the world and saying, what can we do to take a stronger um, approach to preventing? Uh, when I say preventing, intercepting men and that pathway that they take when they move from one piece of material to another and end up watching, you know, really horrible material of children being abused. No one starts like that. No one's born like that. There's a journey they undertake. How do we intercept that journey? What can technology do? What can counselling do? There's some very interesting things happening in Finland and Sweden where they're linking the detection of, of material to the provision of, of counselling services to men who recognise there's kind of a problem with what they're, what they're doing. And that's something I'd like to kind of generalise and, and do more proactively in this country. So I think those were the things that really stood out for me uh, uh, at the sort of the volume of content that we were dealing with last year, which is not going down. You know, it's not clearing. And we're obviously only seeing because of our 
legal limitations, we don't go pay sites. You know, a, a lot of material is hidden behind walls where you have to provide material yourself by a group, or you pay to access that material, and that's not something we have permission from law enforcement to do. So there's a whole load of areas we can't even look for material, but we know it's there. So I'd like to talk to you a bit more about how can we avoid over-censoring? How can we avoid um, censoring material that may actually be helpful rather than harmful in the fight against child sexual abuse? And uh, I noticed that uh, in the IWF's latest uh, annual report, you have a classification of the types of material that's uh, being blocked or, or removed. Um, category one includes the most serious images of minors being sexually abused. Category two is also other sexual conduct by minors. And then category three is everything else. Now, under UK law, um, isn't it true that some of the images in category three are not actually images of real children? They're cartoons or or other uh, fictional representations. Is, are they also included in the images that are added to the IWF uh, block list and URL list? We, um, firstly, we operate, obviously, because we, we have to work with law enforcement, we operate the legal definition of what's illegal content. And that, in, in our case, excludes um, what you might call pornographic content of a, of a general kind, uh, including... Um, you know, schoolgirl videos, you know, things which are where there's a simulation of taboo sexuality, but actually it does involve actors and actresses, and that's very clear in the kind of the thing. And actually, when I did my induction into the, the images, we spent a lot of time, uh, the, the hotline trainer spent a lot of time showing me stuff which you think would involve young children, but actually, because of the angle that was used and the way it was filmed, actually turned out to be adults. So a lot of what we do is not written, not not include images that actually are we think lawful but which many people looking at would think were unlawful having said that we operate to that legal definition we do separate out those categories in making the urls available and it is open to a company not to take say the category c or category b image and only take the category a images so it, you know we say this is what's illegal under british law this is you know the thing the urls we block but there are companies who, for whatever reason, don't take our B and C images because in the United States, for example, while there's a close um, uh, alignment of the law on what we would call the most serious, that you know, the category A images, uh, categories, what we would call categories B and C in the UK, are different to, to the US. Things that are allowed in the US that aren't allowed legally in the UK. And so US companies will choose, may choose not to take you know, not to take those in, not to take that category C because it doesn't comply with US law. Or they will take the US legal definition. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit kind of messy because you're operating in different jurisdictions. But generally, the US companies will operate to a US understanding of what is illegal and the UK companies will operate to, to our, to, to the UK standard. One of the things that's uh, important, I'm sure you'll agree, is uh, the transparency and accountability of the work that's done in this sector. And I think the IWF has done a great job in, in sort of raising the standard there. Um, but do you feel that there's anything more that we can do uh, in this sector to increase the transparency and accountability of the work? Well, I think, to be honest, I think, you know, I'm not saying the model we've got is perfect. But as you know, as you probably know, Jeremy, if you've looked at our model, Firstly, no image is blocked unless a, a human analyst has viewed it. That's not the case with all hotlines. There are hotlines around the world that will simply recommend a blocking on the basis of an algorithmic search, and we think that's wrong. Yeah. Secondly, every, about a, a sample of every image that is recommended to be blocked is reviewed by two senior staff for quality assurance. So it, there's an independent process of review to decide whether or not it it's, should be taken down. Thirdly, we have an independent audit conducted periodically by a senior judge uh, who, as in any other audit process, will take a selection of the Im images that we've chosen to block and, and he'll make, they'll make the selection and they'll review them against the law to make sure we're compliant with the law. And fourthly, although we're a, a private charity, we said that we're, we have, are happy to answer a judicial review inquiry which i guess most people there know what that is what that means is 
for the purposes of reviewing our decisions, we're happy to be treated as a public body because we're performing a kind of public function. Mm. And you can challenge our decision in, in court if you believe we've removed things uh, incorrectly. Uh, that's uh, certainly not happened in my time and not happened in the last few years since the organisation has narrowed the scope of its remit to those very clearly uh, illegal images. I think the other thing we do, where I think people can learn, is A, we only deal with this kind of material. We don't deal with violence. Mm -hmm. We don't deal with other forms of illegal material which are out there um, because we regard that as having a separate specialism requiring a separate, or say, terrorist content, etc. We won't deal with anything like that. We've been asked to, to take on those things. And I think we've taken the view that it's important for us to have a narrow, for any organisation to have a narrow focus. And we also provide quite extensive training for our analysts. We provide psychological support every, so every two months they have access to, they have someone on call the whole time, they have a two month review and they have a one year in-depth um, psychological evaluation by a very eminent psychiatrist. And I think compared to the private companies like Facebook or Google who employ often contractors, you know, looking at material where they've got no real idea what the law is and there's no psychological support. You know, these, these are where I think that it all goes badly wrong. You know, if you've got a bunch of people in the Philippines sitting in a shed looking at pornography all day, trying to decide what should and shouldn't be shown, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get A, some very, very disturbed people in the Philippines at the end of that day, and you're going to get some pretty bad decisions. So I would say... The big lesson for us is having high quality scrutiny that is accountable uh, uh, you know, for any decisions that it makes. And I think that's something where the big companies employing lots of invigilators should really look at their processes. And obviously for most small companies, you know, startups, they haven't got the resource no. to put into this kind of thing. So I think the advantage of our model is you can be a very small startup. You know, you maybe have five people, four, four people running some kind of platform where there's a lot of traffic. You haven't got the time to actually scrutinize that traffic for what's illegal or not. So we can provide that material for you. So I think, I think centralizing, you know, keeping the function very narrow, tying it to the law, making it accountable, having it done by high quality analysts, but making it available to all size companies across the board. I'd say... That's an important lesson for, for other organisations engaged in this kind of work. Are there any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave uh, our meeting with about, uh, you know, how you see uh, online child protection moving uh, or anything that uh, our participants ought to know about? Well, I think, I think the difficulty in the United States, if I can say this, is the the political culture which is driven a lot by a certain kind of moral approach. Yes which tends to lump a whole series of issues in together and issues which ought to be kept quite distinct so you know the whole question of um, sexual material for example sexual practice between adults that's nothing to do with child abuse you know that 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 is the that you know from what i know and i understand because men who go on that path that's a very particular path that goes down in a very particular direction and often has involved men who've had very little sexual contact with other people and actually would benefit from having sexual relationships with others however those are constructed so I think the danger is to say you know we have a problem of I, I don't call it child say I call it child abuse actually child abuse imagery because I don't I separate it out from sexuality which I think is a good thing and a healthy thing and a necessary part of society and one that should be treated with, you know, respect, liberty, you know, dignity, and you know, a degree of social liberalism, from the abuse of, of minors who can't, who can't defend themselves, and I and can't answer back, and who, who suffer un unbelievable horrors because of what's done to them, and I, and I, I just think, you know, the difficulty I think you guys have, from what I see of the political debates in America, is the ability and the inability to separate that kind of abuse that you're trying to deal with in Anastasia from the wider discussion about sexuality in society, that, which seems to me to be a separate kind of conversation and not one to be lumped together. Absolutely. I'm not sure that's helpful to you, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, because, 
you know, we, you know, we don't have that, you know, in that sense, we don't have that situation in the UK. Uh, there's a whole range of things that are possible here legally that are not possible legally in the United States. And I think we're probably better off for that. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, for, for those words. Uh, it's been a great conversation with you. Uh, and uh, once again, thank you for your time. Pleasure. And good, good luck with the event today. I hope it all goes well. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Thanks. So uh, sorry for the patchy audio and video quality there, but I, I hope you got something out of that. Um, I'm going to say a few more words just following on, really, from Andrew's presentation about that topic. Um, and uh, let me go back to my slides. Um, so we're not just talking about um, uh, images. We're also talking about text today. But, but let's dwell on images for a minute, because that's what the IWF deals with. Um, and here is a categorization. This doesn't come from them. This comes from us. Um, uh, you might find this useful. Um, here we've got uh, child pornography. I know child pornography is not the word that we like to use nowadays, because it's, it, it diminishes the seriousness of what it's referring to. However, it is still a legal term. And so for that reason here, I'm, I'm using child pornography in, in its legally defined definition, um, which is uh, displaying you know, sexual activity or, or child's genitalia. Um, it's overlapping with child sexual exploitation material, which is the more uh, preferred term nowadays, um, but they're not quite the same thing. Um, there is some content that's referred to as child sexual exploitation material um, by child protection experts that actually wouldn't class be classified as child pornography because it doesn't satisfy the legal criteria. Um, and in fact, some of that does cross over into the blue uh, circle, which is protected speech. So some constitutionally protected speech is still kind of exploitative, and we may not want that on our platforms, despite the fact um, that it doesn't isn't classified as child pornography. So that's the, the, the difficult area for platforms. They have to decide. Well, look, here's some uh, maybe some uh, you know some family uh, photos that are uh, not child porn, but they're being used in an exploitive exploitative way, and maybe we don't want to um, allow those to be uploaded to our particular platform. Um, and then these other, then in the uh, category four, we have child nudity, some of which may be child porn, some of which may be innocent, protected speech, some of which may be exploitative, some of which not. So you can see here the overlaps. The only circles that don't overlap here are child pornography and protected speech, because legally, um, child uh, pornography is not protected constitutionally protected speech. But everything else have, has overlaps, and the overlaps are where the difficult grey areas are, and we'll be talking about some of those difficult grey areas this afternoon. Um, for example, and I've numbered them, uh, it's a little bit too small for you to read on the screen, but you've got a copy of it in your background paper. Um, let's just take, I won't go through all of them, but let's just take, for example, um, uh, let's, let's have a look at number seven. So the, the, the overlap between what is called child sexual exploitation material and protected speech. So the, uh, um, there are some child protection organizations, and we're not really one of them, um, that say, for example, that uh, uh, cartoons and, um, and representations of non-existing minors in art or fiction ought to be classified as child sexual exploitation material. Um, we would say probably that doesn't make a lot of sense because there are no ch children being exploited. Um, in a cartoon. However, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that's something that you allow on your platform. That's a separate discussion. Um, but I think recognizing that it's different from something that should be made illegal and something that should be criminal to possess is a distinction that's important. And we'll be talking about that this, this afternoon. Um, uh, so, uh, as I say, I won't go through all of these because uh, we lost a bit of time earlier due to the technical difficulties. Um, but maybe just one more I'll go into. So child nudity and child pornography, there's an overlap there um, that concerns when teenagers sexed with each other, maybe boyfriend and girlfriend, 17 years old, are sending sexts to each other. Um, now, that falls within the definition of child pornography, but it's not really child sexual exploitation because neither of them are really exploiting the other. I mean, if it gets picked up and distributed by other people, then it can become child sex sexual exploitation material. But if it's two 17-year-olds sexting with each other, that's not, nobody's being exploited there. So that's an example of, yes, it's child nudity, yes, it's child pornography, 
but no, it's not really child sexual exploitation. So the, the, the whole category, all of this is, most people would lump this in together into one circle and think it's all one thing. It's actually not. There's a, a whole lot of different nuance here that we need to unpack. And we'll be doing some of that today. Um, but as I said, it's not just about images. It's also about speech. We'll be talking today about sometimes speech is disallowed um, or censored um, because it's seen as contributing to child sexual exploitation. And we need to be careful when it comes to speech because speech is a different kettle of fish altogether than images. Um, when you do a, um, and here are some examples of, of types of actual speech, and I mean text, that are being censored on the grounds of child exploitation. The image here, by the way, tell the UN art is not child sexual exploitation material. This is a campaign that Prostasia Foundation ran. Um, we got 17,000, more than 17,000 people to uh, sign a petition to the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, which was saying, hey, we need to add art and fiction to the official legal definition of child pornography. And we said, wait a second, there's a lot of art and fiction that may involve representations of children and sex that we don't want to criminalize. Um, and here are some examples of that. So uh, if you do a Google search for um, Lollicon, Lollicon is, we'll get into this in the afternoon, it's, uh, it's cartoon imagery. Um, the Wikipedia page won't come up. It's been delisted from the Google search engine, even though it's a Wikipedia page. Um, we have books and, and uh, short stories on Amazon that are about age play. Age play is something else we're gonna be talking about in the afternoon. It's not real children. It's not even stories about real children. It's stories about people pretending to be real children um, that are being censored on Amazon. Steam has a, a, a game that's recently been released um, on a different gaming store that was not allowed on the, 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 uh, the Steam store, which is about uh, child sex, sexual exploitation, but it doesn't contain any, any imagery. It doesn't contain um, uh, any sexual acts uh, depicted in the game. It's just about that, but it wasn't allowed on Steam. Um, sex education videos, um, the, the hookup classifieds, um, various types of consensual sexual practices that involve role playing about being a particular, you know, being underage uh, have been disallowed on platforms. Sometimes this is not due to the platform's decision. Sometimes it's, we'll get to that, why? Um, and then most critically of all for our perspective, and you'll hear from this about from some of the other presenters, is child sexual abuse prevention information has been removed from, from platforms due to um, uh, you know, concern that maybe this crosses a line uh, talking about child sexual abuse, talking about pedophilia, for example, uh, may be somehow encouraging it. Um, so so these, are, you know, these are gray areas that we need to take a closer look at today. What are the causes of this over-censorship or this over-content moderation? Um, so Foster is one that we'll be hearing about. Uh, people are worried about this new law um, that seems to uh, be very vague in its application to, um, to, to discussion, to speech about child sexual abuse. Um, we have conservative pressure groups um, like the National Council Against uh, Child Sexual Exploitation, previously known as, no, uh, uh, Morality in Media. I think I got the, uh, the name wrong, uh, but uh, Morality in Media is what they used to be called. Um, and uh, also just garden variety trolls that uh, are putting pressure on platforms to remove speech. Um, generally, as Andrew said in his presentation, there is kind of a sex negative culture that we have to deal with in this country overall. Um, and then it's always accompanied by government threats of if the platforms do not act, then we are going to regulate. Um, we're gonna be hearing about how banking rules have an effect and generally a misunderstanding of what does cause child sexual abuse. Is talking about it a factor that leads to the commission of abuse or is it actually something that can prevent abuse if we talk about it more openly? Um, so we, we throw around words like sexualization. If we talk about child sexual abuse um, or if we talk about minors and sex together, does this sexualize minors and, and make them an object of sexual interest that is going to attract abuse? Um, as a concept, I mean, this is something that's very often used as a justification for why we have, can't have cartoon images, for example. But when we look at research, it, it, is there a link between cartoon images and uh, there's been some on violence, you know, violent films, violent games and real world violence. There's also been some on depictions of sex and sexual violence, but there's less research and there needs to be more of it. 
what research we do have suggests that there isn't a link and that to the extent that there is a link, it may actually be an inverse link um, that representing um, sexual violence or, or underage sex uh, in a fictional form can be, can be cathartic to some people and prevent them from going on to commit acts of sexual violence. But we do need more research about that. Another one is normalization. People fear that by talking about um, pedophilia, for example, we're normalizing it and making it a, um, an acceptable thing, which of course it never will be, it, it never should be. Um, but this is often a justification for why we can't have people talking about this online. Um, and, and it's actually quite problematic. Um, so I'm going to hand over to our next presenter who can actually address this particular topic of, of pedophilia in, in a lot of detail. Hi. As Jeremy said, I'm Candace Christiansen. and I'm the founder and clinical director of the Global Prevention Project. And I really appreciate Dr. Tenbergen and her presentation because it is a great segue into mine. 2018 was a really, enter, uh, oh, how do I describe 2018? It was quite the year for us. It was quite the year for me. In July of 2018, uh, two articles came out libeling my project and saying that I was trying to put P for pedophile at the end of the LGBTQ uh, term or movement and a P flag, a pedophile flag went out and an article went out with that saying that I had created this pedophile flag, my program, the global, someone, whoever, whoever was running the global prevention project had posted uh, you know, this flag, the P flag, and that I was pushing for pedophilia to be have its own flag. As a result of these two articles, they went viral. And so the entire world read about the Global Prevention Project and these two libelous articles about my project. Within 24 hours in July, I was receiving death threats. Uh, my picture and my assistant clinical director's picture were posted on Twitter and we were told that they were coming to get us. They were gonna hang us from the street, li our, like street lights and that we were a bunch of sick pedos, pedo apologists, and that we supported child sexual abuse. An attorney who I'd never met before had written an article. He actually got online, he got on our website, and he read about the prevention work that we were actually doing. And he had written an article about us and said, hey, people, take some time, get to know this pro program. They're actually preventing child sexual abuse by what, what they're doing. They're doing it in their, a different way, but they're doing it. And then uh, I also received an email from a Brazilian journalist who said, who are you? Your, these two articles came out about you and I'm trying to defend you, but I don't know who you are. Who is behind the Global Prevention Project? Are you a pedophile? Are you a group of pedophiles? I don't know, but I need to know in order to defend who you are and your project, because clearly you are preventing child sexual abuse by what you're doing. So I um, had already taken down the Global Prevention Project's Facebook page because we were being attacked so bad. And uh, the night that I received this email, we were actually traveling for work and uh, uh, an individual on Twitter had reached out to me, actually a non-offending minor attracted person and said, have you seen this latest YouTube video about your project? And I clicked on it and some man was now slandering me, had changed our logo to say that we were child sexual abusers. So I was pretty devastated. I sat in my hotel room, I was crying. I told my husband, I think, we need to consider shutting, shutting the Global Prevention Project down. I was devastated. Woke up the next morning and my husband said, you have to plant your flag. You have to, you have to plant your flag. But in order to do that, you need to tell the world who you actually are. You have to tell the world who is behind the Global Prevention Project. So I did. I emailed the journalist and it ended up on our homepage. So if you go to the globalpreventionproject.org, you will now see who I am. 
first and foremost, I am a female child sexual abuse survivor. I'm also a licensed clinician. I've been doing this for 15 years. I'm also an expert in assessing and treating complex trauma, problematic sexual behavior, individuals with minor attractions, autism spectrum, and those with mental illness. I took this off last night, but I'm also, I've also been an expert witness in court on these very issues, and I do court evaluations across the United States as an expert on these very issues. I know what I'm talking about. And lastly, I will not be silenced. You will never, ever silence me. So, when somebody comes to me and they say, I have an attraction to children or teenagers, and I have never harmed a child or a teen teenager, and I have zero intention of harming anyone, and I want help. Guess what? <laughs> Why would I not help them? It is the ethical thing to do. I want everybody to know this, and, and everyone now does, because we are globally known as a result of the haters that came after us last year. But I will never, ever, ever turn a deaf ear on non-offending minor attracted persons who want my help, ever. So non-offending pedophiles, hebophiles, and ephebophiles, what we call under the umbrella of MAPS, or minor attracted persons, so hebophile is the attraction to 11 to 14, and then a FIBA file is 14 to 17. And it can be body type. So when we talk about age, someone can say I have more of an attraction to a body type. They've been silent for most, if not all, of their lives. And they've been silenced. And they've been silenced recently. So, you know, the recent bans we saw on online forums, Medium, Tumblr, Twitter. There were even map blog pages that were taken down for reasons uh, you know, that Dr. Tenberg was saying. You, you put the word pedophile out there and people do not understand. They automatically assume that these are child sexual abusers automatically, and so we, we, have, to act, we have to take these forums down. So I, you know, I spoke with a NOMAP blog contributor on pedophiles about pedophilia recently, and he said we need more platforms. When Pat got taken down by Medium, we were left so vulnerable. And that's true. There is definitely a exposure there and vulnerability there that when these blog, um, blog sites and websites are taken down, leave folks truly vulnerable. Some of you might still be wondering, is there even such a thing as a non-offending pedophile? And I talk about this quite a bit at conferences because I have colleagues who've been in the field for years and years who will say, that doesn't exist. Non-offending does not go before pedophile. Well, it does. So Dr. Tenbergen was talking about the research. We have a lot of other researchers who know this. I know this because I work in the field in the trenches every single day with folks who come to me and say, you know, I need help. So yes, attraction does not equal action. The term pedophile is not synonymous with ch a child molester or a sex offender. And non-offending maps are not just sober sex offenders. The Global Prevention Project. So I never imagined that I would become this big. We now have five treatment tracks. So we have an autism and intimacy program. So, so men who end up legally involved with uh, problematic sexual behavior intimacy issues come to our project. Men who have escalated preoccupations, so as Dr. Tenbergen was saying, you know, they may start out looking at adult porn and then escalate in their viewing into child sexual exploitation material, child pornography. We also have a MAP wellness program because they're not sex offenders. Uh, we have a non-contact legally involved group and program to support those individuals who end up legally involved. Again, these are individuals that are not, not MAPs. And we have a partner and family program to support partners and families of minor attracted persons, partners and families of individuals who sexually offend. We are globally known for a MAP program. 
mainly because of the trolls and the haters last year. So thank you to those trolls and haters. And when I talk about um, anti-contact non-offending maps, there truly are such a thing. So we treat cisgender, non-binary, and transgender individuals who report to us being, again, anti-contact, non-offending, pedophiles, pebophiles, and epibophiles. And on the preventionpodcast.com, you can hear me and my colleague Meg interview them all day long. We interview them all day. That's all we do. So since last, January of last year, we've been interviewing non-offending anti-contact maps. Journalists, researchers, Dr. Tenbergen was on recently, Luke Malone launched our January 2019 podcast. What we know of these individuals, they advocate for child sexual abuse prevention. We want to hear from them. If you go to our maps page on our website, you'll see we want to hear from you. And there are websites, uh, pedophiles about, about pedophilia, for example. We'll talk all about it. There is um, a, definitely a need for that, child sexual abuse prevention, and they communicate that. Speaking of prevention, something I want you to think about because we hear, we hear about this, is can the following be used as a means of prevention for maps? Shotacon, lollycon, erotic stories. I would say yes. We have a gentleman who came to our program and he uh, was really struggling with viewing child pornography. And we look at it as harm reduction. He now is into erotic stories. And to us, there is a benefit to that. He did not want to be viewing child pornography of real live children being sexually abused. It was very, very traumatizing for him. And he knew that he was perpetuating abuse. So it was not something he wanted to be doing. He really, really struggled with that. So something to think about, you know, is this, could these be preventative? For an exclusive map, some will say this may be their only way of expressing their sexuality. And for maps who say, you know what, I have addictive symptoms, I really struggle with this, they'll say this is triggering and I want to avoid it. This is not something I want to be doing. So just something to think about. As I wrap it up, Online stories, blogs, podcasts, and posts of maps are absolutely nece necessary. So they provide other maps with support. We know that isolation creates risk. Map family members get information. Education for clinicians. You know, what type of support do no maps need? I hear from clinicians all over and family members who say, thank you for your podcast. We have our you know, resource page where we say, check out these other sites because it's very informative. And as Dr. Tenbergen was saying, researchers will have, get, it gives researchers access to this underground community for research. So it's very, very beneficial if we are allowing maps to be on social media and out there. These forums are so necessary. So I'm just going to play this short clip from our podcast from Marie the Map. Um, and I do think having a sense of being a part of a community, like you mentioned again, that you 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 stumbled into uh, upon Burphead and that you started to you know get to know people and create friendships within the community. That that as well helps with the the humanization of what these people are experiencing, which also in turn helps you to understand more about what's going on in you. If you were to see where I was at 13, like uh, the stories I was writing about these evil pedophiles that were like scary and like the, 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 the protagonist as being an abuse survivor to where I am now with my relationship with pedophilia like just because that was accessible and something that I and so many young math people can get to like it makes us see ourselves as human and that's the most important thing so I just want to end by saying believe in you in you unicorns because I've been considered a unicorn I think the work I do truly is um like that you know and so so necessary I'm all about humanizing maps, um, and I really think it's important that we understand them as human beings and individuals who are not lumped in a category, and we need to hear their voices. They, de they deserve to be heard, so thank you very much.
All right. Um, well, so yeah, my name is Guy Hamilton Smith, and I am the uh, legal fellow for the Sex Offense Litigation and Policy Resource Center at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, which is like a whole lot of words, and if you like say them three times fast, you win a prize. Um, so what I'm here to talk about today is um, a lot of social media platforms and technology platforms have blanket policies to say if you're someone who's ever been convicted of a sex offense, then you're not allowed to use this platform. So uh, for instance, Facebook is probably the most notable uh, social media platform that has this policy, but of course they roll that same policy out to um, any IP platform that they acquire, such as Instagram. Other platforms also execute these policies. So what I'm gonna talk about is why, while that sounds like really good, uh, reasonable policy, right? Uh, because we all care about creating safe communities. We all care about preventing sexual harms, uh, both online and in our physical communities. It's actually kind of bad policy that actually um, undermines the very things that we're trying to achieve. And it's bad policy because they're not really based in the realities of sexual harm. They're not evidence-based or responsive to what we know about sexual harms and who is uh, causing them. And platforms, I think, have a responsibility to adopt evidence-based principles and practices. Um, and so, because to the extent that people who are exiting the criminal legal system, who have been held accountable for a crime, and now are trying to lead uh, successful and meaningful lives, to the extent that those people succeed, then we all succeed, right? Because we don't want people to keep committing crimes. We want them uh, to live law-abiding lives. And so my pitch today is basically that these blanket exclusionary policies that if you've been convicted of uh, X, Y, or Z offense, that you cannot use this platform, they should be, uh, they should be removed. And, uh, and that's for, and so without, I'm not gonna like go too much into like the, the weeds on like all the numbers and things like that, but if you want like the actual data, I can certainly provide that. But I'll start off by saying there is, uh, a lot of my work with the law school that I work for is in the area of effective sexual violence prevention and policy and squaring that with constitutional rights. And so I work a lot with sex offense registries uh, and also civil indefinite civil commitment. And a lot of the, the, the beliefs that undergird those legal policies are that people who commit sex, sexual offenses, they go on to commit more and more and more sexual offenses and there's just no way of stopping them. Uh, but that's not, that's really not the case, right? That the, um, the Supreme Court sort of propagated this myth in a pair of 2003 United States Supreme Court decisions, and without going into all the details about like why these are myths and why they're wrong, I will just actually refer to the Michigan Attorney General, um, who just recently, a few months ago, filed this brief in, um, this was in a state court case about the Michigan Sex Offense Registry talking about, uh, and essentially the brief breaks down um, all the social science research that's known about sexual offending and sex offense registries and these sorts of exclusionary policies. And uh, you know, this is the Attorney General saying that research refutes common assumptions about recidivism rates that supposedly justify SOAR's extreme burdens, the Sex Offender Registry Act. And regardless of what one believes about recidivism rates, registries are not good tools to protect the public. So uh, instead of me being up here trying to convince you about, well, recidivism rates are low and these aren't actually very good policies that protect the public, this is an elected official, the attorney general saying things that, I mean, I've been saying, uh, civil rights attorneys have been saying, social science experts have been saying, uh, and but this is coming from, well, I mean, the attorney general is the top law enforcement official uh, of the state. And so when the attorney general says it, normally that should mean that people should pay attention to it because the attorney general's um, interest in these issues is in creating effective policy. So essentially, recidivism rates are low, right? And um, these exclusionary policies like sex offense registries and banishment laws, they don't do a lot to create um, public safety. And this is one of the reasons why. Um, this is, uh, so these are just a sort of sampling of 100 reported sex offenses. Like if you just imagine, imagine the pool of sex offenses that get reported to the police, 
here is just um, you know a sampling of 100 of them. And of these 100, only four are going to be attributable to people who have a prior record of committing any kind of sexual offense. And so these bans, like we're talking about, where well, if you've been convicted of a sex offense and you can't use Facebook or you can't use uh, Instagram or what have you, well, they're only targeting, they could only potentially target you know, those four cases. All the other cases, these bans, to the extent that we're relying on them for creating uh, community safety, they cannot address them. Um, and so, I, in, also in lieu of numbers, I decided to throw a couple memes in here too. Uh, <laughs> these bans also rely on the assumption that people are going to tell the truth, right? That uh, if you're going to get on social media and you want to use social media to commit a crime, that you're going to sign up with your real name, you're going to sign up with your, all your actual information and hand that over. Um, and you could just get on the internet and tell lies, right? Uh, and then, of course, there's the classic New Yorker, uh, New Yorker cartoon there on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Um, on the internet, no one knows you're a sex so uh, the idea is that these policies actually incentivize deception. Right? They incentivize people lying. They incentivize people sort of going underground. And that shouldn't be what we want from our policies. We should want policies that incentivize transparency. We should want policies that incentivize people um, you know, sort of living above board. And so the legal landscape of these law of these sort of uh, principles of banishment are that it's illegal for the government to do it. Um, there was actually a United States Supreme Court case that came out in 2017 where uh, North Carolina had a law that said if you've ever been convicted of a sex offense, you can't use any social media platforms. And the Supreme, it wound up going all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said uh, this is unconstitutional. And in saying that, they said even convicted criminals and, oh, let's see, even convicted criminals and in some instances especially convicted might receive legitimate benefits from these means of access for access to the world of ideas, in particular if they seek to reform and pursue lawful and rewarding lives. The idea is that when people exit the criminal legal system and they're still sort of classified as sex offenders, even despite having been served their sentences, the idea is we want them to succeed. And what the research pretty convincingly shows is that to the extent that we give people, that people have housing, have jobs, that people have stakes in their community, that people have community and support, they succeed. They don't go on to commit additional crimes because these are all reasons to stay out of prison. These are all reasons to do things um, the right way. And these policies essentially undermine all of those things because social media and technology platforms are becoming more and more ubiquitous in the modern era, as uh, Justice Kennedy uh, recognized. And, uh, you know, if you need a for instance, I will uh, give you one. And that, for instance, uh, I guess this has to go through the animation, is me. Uh, here's me. Uh, so, I committed a crime in 2006, back when I was 22, and had a lot more hair. Um, I had a really sort of compulsive relationship with internet pornography and was kind of downloading everything I Across. And eventually that came to include illegal images, and I was caught with them, and I was prosecuted and went through the legal system. Uh, that actually got me to go to law school, uh, and I went to law school and worked in criminal defense and civil rights for several years. Uh, but I also um, wound up suing my way onto Twitter in 2017. And this is actually, uh, it's a long story how this piece came about, but I was essentially taunting the Kentucky State Police on Twitter because they were not abiding by a federal court order. I don't recommend taunting the state police on Twitter, by the way. It's not a great idea. Uh, my, wife was, my wife was big mad at me. Um, but anyway, uh, so I got on Twitter in 2017. I should also say, like, uh, my arrest like, saved my life in a lot of different ways, and I'm actually really grateful for having gone through the legal process. Um, and I did an AMA about, I got on Reddit too, and I did an AMA about my whole story and my journey and my, um, 
uh, experiences, and I've written about uh, my whole journey pretty extensively too. So if you're curious, it's all available. But the idea is that uh, we sued uh, we sued the government in federal court, got on Twitter, and since then, it's totally changed my life. It's actually brought me to why I'm here. Um, it's how I became become involved in Jesus Angel. It's why I have my current job. Uh, I do a lot of writing for national outlets on issues of criminal justice at the intersection of sexual violence and sexual violence prevention. And uh, it also, I mean, it, it's, it's hard for me to overstate how important social media access is. Yeah, how we make social media access. To be able to um, be able to communicate not only about, about, about the stories that are uh, and to be able to talk about these very difficult issues, but also to be able to advocate for more effective and humane policy. Um, and without that, uh, without that access, I simply wouldn't have been able to do it. And there are many more people who could also be able to, um, you know, as you know, as Justice Kennedy said, uh, might receive legitimate benefits from these means of access to the world of ideas, in particular if they seek to reform and pursue lawful and rewarding lives. Um, I can't think of anything more rewarding than you know a lot of the things that have happened over the last year and a uh, year, year and a half of my life. So um, anyway, the the idea, the in, in summation, I'll just basically say the idea is that we all care about creating safety. And we care about holding people accountable for the harm that they cause. I mean, I'll be the first to say that people should absolutely be held accountable for that. But then once people are held accountable, we need to, we need to develop policies that incentivize helping them transition into being uh, lawful and productive and healthy members of society. And to the extent that our policies don't do that, we should really reconsider. Um, and again, if anyone, um, Wants any uh, additional sort of any of the actual numbers? Then I'm certainly happy to uh, provide them. You can just grab me or um, uh, just shoot me an email or come on Twitter or an Albert Court So thank you very much. Hi everyone. My name is Ian O'Brien. Um, I'm the uh, director of policy, uh, not policy, of programs and operations of the Free Speech Coalition or FSC. Uh, with the North American Trade Association for the adult industry, um, both covering adult entertainment, porn, and pleasure products, sex toys. Um, but uh, as you can tell, there's a, uh, and I, I've mentioned this before, I think at the, the opening um, or the launch party for Stasia, um, that I don't think any other industry um, is defined or has an identity um, based on what it is not. So, uh, uh, while we peddle in sex, what, what we call ourselves as adults is um, to, in, in juxtaposition um, for this idea of we are not children. We don't work with children. Um, and that's uh, been something that we've used uh, to, to prove our existence um, and kind of define our legality in the space. Um, my background is in public health, uh, mostly sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, I worked at Advocates for Youth in uh, New York for a while, and here I was at GSA Network for a little bit, um, improving access to a variety of uh, sexual and reproductive needs, um, both in terms of advocacy and health systems. Um, why is that relevant? Uh, well, because I work at a trade association, and uh, uh, that's a fairly unique skill set for, for industry. Um, uh, trade associations typically uh, work to either increase revenue for a um, given industry or at least protect uh, the revenue that exists. Um, however, uh, the majority of our work since our existence has largely been around the existential threat to sexual content um, and the material workplace safety concerns that come with it. Uh, simply, my job is to kind of humanize uh, the adult industry um, and the workers in it and also provide uh, uh, basic dignity for their humanity and, and the things that they need to get their, their jobs done. Um, uh, I also brought up our mission here um, because it's, it's fairly wordy and uh, I would argue with my ED about the, the length of it and he definitely would get mad at me for talking about it. But, but I, a, a lot of the key pieces in here, um, as you can see in the second piece, 
Uh, all people are protected from exploitation and are empowered by age appropriate sexual health education are, are important to our values as a, an organization, absolutely, but also things that we know we strategically have to, to say, um, to talk about sex, to be ourselves, to, to exist in a, a sexual content space. We always need to be um, as far away from the idea of exploitation as we possibly can. Um, so I'm just going to, there's so much things to talk about, about what porn is, uh, what pleasure products are, and what we do. I'm going to give you a general uh, landscape of uh, who we are, what I, what I think the key points you should know, um, and kind of what we're dealing with in, uh, in terms of, of legal regulation, um, but also kind of corporate censorship and how we exist in those spaces. Um, uh, so the things we want you to know about porn. Um, this is, is pretty common sense, but uh, what I've learned about working in porn for a while is that uh, common sense kind of goes out the window. Um, we're exceptionalized a lot of space, but uh, people in the sex industry are people with families. Um, so we're real people with real families. When you make laws or, or things that, that affect uh, sex workers in general, but also the adult industry, um, you're affecting their children um, and themselves and their lives. Uh, so they're, they're, when we talk about uh, sexual content, there's always the, the kind of um, uh, image of the, the theoretical child that's over there. Um, and abuse and exploitation does happen, but also uh, feeding children is a real thing. Um, and getting people money to be able to afford to feed their children are a real thing. Um, and the second piece of this, or actually I'll move to the... Um, the third bullet point is that we're a rapidly decentralizing the industry. Um, we're no longer uh, the, the porn industry of the, the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, where there's like eight or nine major production studios that are producing the majority of pornographic content out there. Um, we, like the rest of industry, have uh, been greatly affected by technology um, and gig economies. Um, so like the vast majority of content that's produced uh, is people with their phones by themselves, monetizing it in, in micro ways, um, either through cam sites or clip stores. Uh, so when, I, when I'm talking about industry and impacting industry and, and rules and regulations, we're not, we're not talking about the Vivids um, or, or other major production houses anymore. We're talking about single moms in Mississippi who are like webcamming at night to make extra cash because they can't afford like child support um, or, or uh, child care. Um, and it's a, it's so, I, I'm looking at their concern and their human rights too. Um, uh, we're also an enormous and historically insular uh, market. So the, the enormity of porn is huge. Um, we know that the vast majority of people um, have used porn at some point in their lives. Um, a lot of people use it daily. Um, it's some of the most trafficked sites in the world. Um, we know it's a part of people's everyday routines, but also we're separated from, from uh, the rest of industry in major ways. Uh, and uh, though that's changing a lot due to technology and kind of the, the micro uh, production that's occurring, um, but we have set up our own kind of industry specific tools and resources. Um, and uh, that I think where we're coming to a, a moment right now is that kind of clash between seeing how we have done things historically, how we have like uh, curated and protected and like dealt with our, our issues and content. And now that it's, it's entering uh, social media spaces, larger tech platforming spaces, um, things that individual people are marketing themselves, we're seeing a lot of friction. Um, and we're also a legal industry. And uh, I, I always, now I don't want to like name that in opposition to forms of like criminalized sex work. Um, FSC stands in complete solidarity with all notions of uh, decriminalization of sex work um, and don't believe the law is a particularly useful form of moral guidance. Uh, but porn's existence is legal and regulated. Um, the history of that is kind of seen of our name, uh, the Free Speech Coalition, though the, the existence of porn uh, is protected through, at least in the United States, through First Amendment issues. Um, but uh, we kind of see current industry threats um, have largely focused on the potential um, threats of porn to community health, whether that be through notions of exploitation, violence, or addiction. So what's our current government landscape? Um, 2257 record keeping. Now this is uh, uh, 
uh, challenged in the courts for, for decades now. Um, I'm going to say decades, at least 10 years. I don't know. It's been a long time. Um, but uh, it's currently uh, just being appealed by the government again. We just won a favorable decision in the, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, but essentially what this law does is require incredibly strict record keeping of all producers of adult content to make sure that uh, all the content is filmed of people of legal age, um, which uh, on paper sounds fantastic. The, the problems that we've had have been um, the record keeping requirements are incredibly onerous. Um, and particularly, uh, and uh, required like freely accessible um, documentation of a, for a long time, um, which if you work in the sex industry, being able to have people publicly access to your records and your identity is not a great thing. Um, uh, it also put a burden on secondary producers. Um, currently, this is a major issue. Uh, secondary producers being anyone who uh, collects content and then that they didn't necessarily produce themselves. Um, uh, this has been an issue when we're dealing with like micro production. Um, uh, when you have giant studios that have major compliance departments and people looking through, like making sure that all the records are kept and that there's like a special file and you've got a room and the budget for it, that's one thing. Um, when you're, again, that a uh, single mom in Mississippi, it's a much harder to comply with those rules and regulations. Um, so currently where this stands is there's, a, there's an injunction on 2257 record keeping as the, the government wants it. However, um, the rules are, are currently being in, uh, adhered to. Um, and then uh, the idea and the current suggestion is that there's gonna be a much less onerous form of record keeping. Um, according to the public health crisis resolutions have also been passed in, I think, 15 states so far. Uh, those, uh, these are, they're non-enforceable resolutions. Um, they uh, just declare that porn is problematic um, and has some kind of harm to the community. This is usually based on addiction frameworks uh, to the psychologists in the room um, and anybody else. Like addiction science is incredibly complicated. Uh, what we do know is that uh, uh, at best, the, the evidence that uh, porn is addictive is controversial. We do know that it is a super normal um, stimulus and in so that like porn affects people individually. So there's not necessarily a like blanket, all porn affects people in this way and therefore it's like heroin, which like would have some kind of physiological effects. Um, but like psychometric, uh, physiological and clinical uh, uh, kind of blanket descriptions of pornography don't fit addictive models. Um, however, um, we're, we're seeing this change in rhetoric from porn is a moral crisis to porn is a, a health crisis, likely due to the like amoralness or not, I like to say uh, uh, morally universal um, nature of health. Like you, you can't argue with health. Um, uh, human trafficking is also another way that uh, porn is being talked about. Um, I know that Kristen D'Angelo at SWAP is going to talk more about how SESTA and FOSTA is affecting uh, sex workers, um, which has done much more than uh, sex workers in the adult industry. Uh, but uh, other uh, uh, proposed legislation like the HTPA, the Human Trafficking Prevention Act, um, and banking bills have suggested that there's a major tie between pornography um, and human trafficking. Uh, the HTPA in particular, which has just been blanket legislation introduced to a variety of conservative legislatures in the United States, has been, um, uh, would make it so that children exposed to uh, porn by their peers, the, the producer of that content would be liable um, for that exposure. We don't see it going anywhere, but that like rhetoric has been entering uh, legislatures more and more. Um, the last one internationally, and I just wanted to give this as a count of kind of the landscape of how people are viewing porn, um, is a, I think it was September of last year, uh, the Indian Supreme Court uh, put a, a ban on, or enforced an older ban on porn following the gang rape of a young girl. The, because the, the, um, the perpetrators had used porn prior to the assault. And the, the connection here is instead of dealing with the larger systemic issues that, that, for, uh, that might be causing something like gang rape and sexualized violence, 
um, we can kind of push it on this like blanket understanding of porn um, and deal with the issue. So like not actually engaging with, with the, the needs of the community, but rather uh, taking this controversial um, uh, idea, porn, um, and uh, placing all the blame there. Um, corporate censorship has also been impacting us uh, a lot. Uh, as I said, there's been a lot of frictions between the, the move from a, a decentralized industry and uh, as people begin to market themselves on social media platforms um, and, and needing to like monetize their content in a variety of different ways, we've probably been impacted by the gig economy more than most. Uh, we've seen a struggle with uh, major internet platforms trying to figure out what they do with sexual content. Uh, the, the simple answer has been to, to remove it and push it to the side uh, it, and ignore the problem largely. And so, uh, aside from a grassroots effort from all these micro like, content producers, it's been hard to kind of engage in these larger conversations, which is part of the reason I'm excited to be here. Um, currently, uh, or Instagram is also a, an interesting case of what's happening um, because we're seeing this uh, tension between models um, providing or posting the same kind of content that a Kim Kardashian would, um, but being singled out largely, and we think, because of their affiliation with the adult industry. Like the, the imagery is similar, if not identical, um, but there's this uh, uh, through line of, oh, you, you're a porn star um, or a sex worker, uh, and that's why content is being filtered out and censored. Right now, Twitter is largely where a lot of the adult content conversations happen um, uh, because they, they provide the, the least amounts of censorship around what people are allowed to do and market their work. Um, uh, though uh, ideas of shadow banning still uh, perpetuate the, the industry. Um, anyway, uh, that's kind of a, the broad overview of what porn is dealing with at the moment. Um, and uh, we're, we're excited to be here and talk about what we can do. Hello, everyone. Um, as Jeremy said, I'm Kathy Beardsley. I'm super happy to be here. Um, I don't normally get to participate in venues like this. I tend to be at risk conferences and banks, and here I get to really feel like I'm being part of something that's gonna be changing. So you're probably wondering, <laughs> What the fox? Um, why is she here? And uh, I have to thank Ian. Back in January, he called me on the phone and he said, hey, Kathy, I'm participating in this organization and the subject of payment processors came up. And there were two schools of thoughts on you. One is that you were very shady and you were profiting off bad business that was going through the internet. And then there was another school of thought that pertained more to freedom of speech, um, expression, and that is that you operate under these really constricting rules, they seem senseless, and they don't make sense to anyone. So I'm here today to really show you that I'm not just rabbit box. Just rabbit box. But first and foremost, I'm a, I'm a protective mother hen. I have three children who are teenagers, or one's almost a teenager, and they spend almost all their time, when they're not doing sports or school, with a device in their hand. They're looking at Snapchat, and Instagram, and things I don't even know what so number one, um, my number one job, both personally and professionally, is to make sure our children are protected. But the other is really to help bridge a gap. I run a company that specializes in taking payments for the porn industry. And my job there is really help those merchants, clients, grow their business and run a, a business that's compliant. So managing, protecting children and also giving them the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression to put their niche out there and, and have some fun. So as I said, a little bit about me. Um, I'm the CEO and owner of SegPay. Started the company in 2005. I've been in this payment space for 20 years. Um, I've been doing high risk for 20 years, or adult content for 20 years. I'm a member of the Free Speech Coalition. That's why I got to know Ian. I'm the vice president of the board. Really, my goal has been to be how do you manage all the players in the space? How do I work with the card brands all the way down to the merchant that wants to put content on the web and profit from it? A little more, I'm going to kind of zip through these, just um, I think it's important to get to know me to 
get over that rabbit box. Uh, as I said, we started in 2005. Uh, we flew out from Florida yesterday. That's where our headquarters is. We also operate with merchants in Europe, which requires me to have staff and physical presence in Europe. Um, so we're set up in the UK and Oxford, and thanks to Brexit, I now have to go to Ireland to operate and be compliant. And I am registered with Visa and MasterCard as what they call a payment service provider or a payment facilitator. And just for reference, we're only one of three companies in the U.S. blessed by Visa and MasterCard to handle adult transactions. And then also in Europe, we're licensed under the Payment Services Directive. So we go through a whole host of regulatory looks at our business to be able to do what we do in Europe. Um, we've been, as I said, 14 years in the space. These are the two most important, why do banks work with us, and then why do merchants choose us? The banks work with us because we've been, uh, we've earned a reputation of managing the business properly. They know this business is out there, they want to do it compliantly, and they also want to profit from it. And the merchants use us for the exact same reason. We have merchants that do $2,000 a month, and merchants that do over millions of dollars a month. And they want to work with someone that's going to tell them the rules, be transparent, and protect their money. But they do have families that they keep <laughs> off of their business. Um, and kind of, I guess, personally and both professionally, um, as Candace talked about it, um, it's been important for me to, to own the space I'm in. You know, I'm on the soccer field, and some will say, well, what do you do? Well, I tell them what I do. And I think it's important both from a personal standpoint and professional to say, this is the space I'm in, this is what I'm comfortable doing, and this is really what we've become an expert. And to that extent, if you go to our website, kind of find pictures, you'll find myself, my management team, you'll find other members of SegPay. So we're out there. Um, as I said, Visa MasterCard. I think I put PayPal up here because PayPal is typically steered away from the adult space. Um, we recently were approved by PayPal, and adding that in as one of our payment options, there's only a few players that they'll work with. So again, it's a company that's taken back off stance and saying, I'm gonna dip my toe in the water, I'm gonna try it with a group that has a reputation of doing a good job. And now, this is, I'm gonna get into the rules and what our role is. It's not nearly as interesting as all of the other speakers have presented, but I think it's important for you to understand. Um, so, first of all, where did all these rules come from, right? We have federal government, the Federal Trade Commission, um, because we're in Europe, we're working off EU Commission, the EU Parliament, and really, a lot of the rules that I have to manage do come from the card brands and the banks, but they're all interwoven. Something comes from the federal government, it rolls down into the card brands, all the banks, all the banks. Um, there's several types of rules. The card brands have something called brand policies, and these are policies that they put out there that said, we do not want our brand associated with this type of content. Obviously, child pornography, um, we talked about um, force, anything that they believe is forced, and then it gets into this gray area where, well, someone's sleeping, that's force. Someone's drunk, that's force. So we have to be very, you have to really go through it with a nuance to say what is force. Um, this applies to the federal regulations. We talked about 2257, which is the whole model age verification. All the models on the site must be of age, and they have to have proof that they're for age. Last year, SESTA, FASTA, FASTA, SESTA rolled out and scared the entire industry. Um, and within that regulation, they took away the safe harbor, where um, technology providers such as myself um, could be held liable if we knowingly are, are aware of sex trafficking or something bad going on within one of our merchants, if I'm profiting from that, I myself could go to jail. And that scared just probably, that's where you see Twitter and everyone else kind of, I think a lot of that stemmed from Sesta Pasta. We have privacy regulations um, in Europe. Last year they rolled out um, general data privacy regulation. Um, California has one that's going in place, I think, in October. And again, that's for consumers having the right to be forgotten. Um, and then we have to make sure with all the parties who communicate information, they're forgotten. Um, UK is rolling out the Age Verification um, Act. That's been talked about for a couple of years. It's finally going into place in July that we have to be compliant and make sure um, our, our merchants are. And for those of you that don't know what that is, in, in 
any UK consumer that accesses, um, is going to access the official website, before they can see any type of content, they have to show that they've been, they have to provide two forms of verification or get pre-approved that they are above the age of 18. And there's a whole host of any wondering laws that we have to deal with, and that's really about knowing who we're working with. What's my role? Um, I really do become the content cop, I like to say. So, um, first of all, we do a thorough review of all the websites. And we have to make sure that all those websites are have models of the age of 18 and over. If they don't, we cannot process for them. If we have a question, we'll ask for the, for the information on that model, so they'll have to provide passports and so on. Um, I will, um, social media, dating sites, social networks, those are all very scary to us because those are all user uploaded content. But we have really no control of is that good content, bad content, and at the end of the day, I'm held responsible for it. Uh, one of what's kind of interesting is that um, websites that are using affiliates or marketing partners, if they're using a mar marketing partner that has prohibited content and is pushing consumers to their website, that whole component is illegal. And we can take on fines and even if you have someone out here not directly related to the site pushing consumers to your website. And lastly, we don't process or escort sites. Um, again, those have nice sex trafficking, as you believe, and we go to jail. On the other side of things really for this is children's Oh, sorry. Good. The other um, area that we're, we're worrying about is the children looking at the content. And here we don't have such good regulations or really tools to monitor it. We require all of our, our merchants to have a splash page to say before they can see any content, you must be over 18. That's really not a great check because any kid can click through it and go, go through. I think the one to really watch is the UK age verification where you'll have to put in credentials. Um, into that into the site before you can get to see the content and uh, my understanding is other european countries are looking at it australia is looking at it it's been bounced around in the u.s so you're probably wondering why are you in the middle of all this well we're we're here because we're part of the the profit chain uh use mastercard make money the banks make money i make money the merchants make money and so what the best way to kind of choke it down is to go after the food chain. Um, so we're in it together. Um, we all work together to keep it safe. A couple things, um, kind of getting into the nitty gritty, but before we can even take on a merchant, um, and I think this maybe sets us apart from some of the, the social networks, is that we have to do a thorough vetting of all the merchants that work with us. 20 years ago when I started, you could go on, fill out an online form, press submit, and we'd find someone up to start them processing. We had no idea who they are. Today we go through um, the corporate documents, who the beneficial owners are, the validation of the beneficial owners, um, so we know exactly who we're working with. Every website must be manually reviewed by our team. Um, we then use third-party tools that go out and scan those websites to make sure the content is compliant, and then ultimately it goes up to our bank. The banks work off of something called a match list or terminated merchant file globally. And if someone's ever had a problem, they're going to trigger that radar and most likely won't get to move forward. Um, from there, it goes to Visa and MasterCard, and there's a registration process there. So all the way through the food chain in our space, um, the merchants know, all the way up to Visa and MasterCard. What happens when I don't do this? Um, so I talked to them about the card brands. If I'm found to be processing for content that they consider against their terms, I can take on a fine of anywhere from $250,000 up over into the million. Um, I can have legal action taken against my company. Um, I have reputational damage if I'm about to be doing things that aren't proper. And I guess I put the one in orange, jail time or Sesta Pasta. Those are places I don't want to go. We can, so once, just to make sure we're always safe, 
we are constantly doing uh, monitoring of our emergence. So every year we go back through the KYC process. Every month we scan every single URL because a bad player in this space could put up a perfectly compliant website, get them approved, change out all the content, and away they go. Um, our banks come visit us, Visa and MasterCard visit us, so we're, we're heavily regulated and watched. The last item that's really important is that we have a requirement to report, and we have had problems. Not a lot. Uh, I think my last problem was three or four years ago when we did find one of our merchants um, actually has a very compliant website, and over here had a, a bad website with uh, CP images. We found it. Um, mainly your heart sinks. When you're in that role, you feel horrible. Um, but our first step was to notify our banks, the card brands, and then we're required to notify um, the Missing and Exploited Children Center in DC. And then from there, we were given direction on how they wanted us to handle. And in this case, they said, hey, Kathy, we want you to keep that site alive because you have a lot of information about these people. Um, we ended up working with Homeland Security. They came in, we gave them all the consumer records, we gave them all the information on the customer, and this customer actually was overseas. And they, it took them about a year and a half. They actually found the individual, prosecuted them, and as awful as that first finding was, there was, for me, a positive finding that someone that was doing bad work was taken to jail. So last question, I think I've talked a lot about how I'm constricting freedom of expression uh, or free speech, but we do have a voice. Um, do our reputation, if there's something in the gray area, I can pick up the phone and I can call MasterCard and say, I don't know what this is, or I'm a little concerned, what's your view on this? And so we can help kind of shape the direction um, for MasterCard Visa as well as for our merchants. And the same thing, when we find something with one of our websites that could be problematic, we'll reach out to them, be very transparent, this is what's going to happen, if we don't fix this, we work for them to fix it. Um, but at the end of the day, my job is to, I don't want to use the word be a cop, but be protecting the space, and if something's not right, we have to stop crossing it. And that's it. Thank you. I'm here, um, I'm Kathy Gellis. Um, Let's see, I'm here to give you a crash course in Section 230, which is the law that has been very, very good to enable the internet to exist and now has been changed and is making all of our lives very difficult. Um, so I'm gonna give you a crash course in how it used to work and why we've come to a screaming halt. Um, I am a lawyer, I am not your lawyer. If I were your lawyer, we would have signed a letter saying so, and you'd probably be giving me money. Um, and I want to say that, A, as the, um, because I'm a lawyer and I like to cover my ass because that's what lawyers do, uh, but also because legal advice needs to be particular to your situation. And I can't give that here. Um, for one thing, the law is really complicated and complex, and nobody's situated in exactly the same way. Um, what I'm here to do, though, is to sort of give a big picture of the laws out there and that operates in certain ways. And I think it's really good if we understand what the law does and how it operates, because no matter who you are, it's good to understand we live in a democracy. And if we're not happy with our laws, it's good to understand what's gone wrong so we can try to fix them. Okay, so we're going to get in our time machine and go back to 1995. And we're going to note a couple of things that were going on in 1995. One of them is a case called Stratonoke Font versus Prodigy. Prodigy, anybody remember that? Raise your hand if you remember what Prodigy was. Okay, so before we had the internet, what we used to have is little dial-up services um, where people would use a modem, it made that horrible crashing sound, and they would connect to a larger server where it was a proprietary environment. It was something like Prodigy, America Online, where you would dial up and be in a community talking to other users of that service. Sometimes they're called bulletin board services. I'm not quite sure exactly how Prodigy labeled itself, but this was before we all started to, all these services eventually became full service ISPs connecting people to the larger internet. But until that happened, they were their own little communities. 
Um, Prodigy was one of them. Prodigy was getting not the sort of volume we necessarily see now, but pretty significant user volume. I think there was a statistic of like 75,000 posts per month or something like that. Something that not as big as what a lot of our social media and ISPs are seeing today, but was way too much for Prodigy to be able to keep track of. It was a lot of, a lot of people posting a lot of stuff. Um, and one of the bits of stuff that got posted was arguably defamatory. Um, and the person who was offended by this sued, but he didn't sue the person who'd made the offending speech, or maybe he did that too. He sued Prodigy and said, how dare you let, let somebody come onto your site and defame me? You should be liable for that. Now, there had been some pre-existing case law that said, that's ridiculous. That's secondary liability. Why are you, nobody's their brother's keeper. Nobody's their user's keeper. Why are you making them liable? But a New York state court said, eh, we're going to make you liable for this defamatory content, which all of a sudden created a big danger for these online service providers, whether they were internet online service providers or private proprietary ones, this is really a problem. If they could be held liable for the stupid crap that people posted on their systems, they were not going to be able to continue to provide the services for the non-stupid crap that people put on because it, they would have to be responsible for it. It would be chilling. If you've got 75,000 user posts a month, you don't know what's going wrong with it. How are you going to review all that and make sure that it doesn't offend some sort of law somehow? So meanwhile, um, Congress was dealing with the kind of moral panics we have done now. Um, moral panics, if we're not familiar with the term, generally unfounded hysteria. We're really upset with something. We're not thinking of the children adequately. Bad things are happening. Everything's on fire. Do something, do something, do something. And in 1995, members of Congress were very, very, very concerned that there was porn all over the internet and that this was very, very bad and we must do something. So the thing that they decided to do was come up with the Communications Decency Act. So you have these two things going on. So most of Congress is doing the Communications Decency Act. But meanwhile, there was also some con members of Congress who were really concerned about what had just happened with the Stratton Oakmont case and said, we need to make sure that that doesn't happen again. We need to make sure that platforms are not in the position of having to do the impossible task of monitoring all their user content. And we can argue this consistently with what this overall Communications Decency Act is. Congress did not want bad stuff on the internet, but it did want good stuff on the internet. So these two things came together and became part of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. Then there was a lawsuit because a lot of what the Communications Decency Act was called for censorship. And the First Amendment does not like censorship. And so there was this big court case called Reno versus ACLU, where the US Supreme Court said the censorship stuff up with which we shall not put, the First Amendment doesn't allow this. And so most of the first, most of the Communications Decency Act was struck out. But what was left standing was Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And here we get to we're looking at the act, we're looking at the statutory language. And the first thing I wanna point out is Congress put in the beginning of the statute what it was trying to accomplish, which was basically what I just said. We want the most good stuff on the internet and the least bad. So they have a preamble text. Congress finds, and this basically boils down to the internet is pretty cool. They're still raving about the internet, it's good. We've got all these, systems that have started to flourish. We get all this discourse, all this political, educational, cultural, and entertainment services. We want more of this, more of this good stuff. And then it starts talking about, okay, what's the policy of the United States to make sure that we'll get it? We want to do things that will promote the most good stuff. We want to make sure we've got the commercial viability of people who are going to produce these services. Um, we wanna make sure that people have control over what they experience. We do not want all the porn coming into people's mailboxes if they don't want it. We wanna make sure, they were very fixated on filters back then. Um, that's a side topic of how, how well filters actually work, but this was something they were thinking quite a, a bit about back then. Um, but they also wanted to make sure that, okay, 
we want the good stuff, we don't want the bad stuff, so we also want some statutory ways of coping with the bad stuff. Uh, I'll just make sure. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit to the two most important definitions that show up in this, um, in this statute, and then we'll get to why they're important. The first one at 230F2 is interactive computer service. Basically, this is the platform. This is the ISP. This is the social media service. This is Patreon. This is Twitter, Facebook. Um, this is anybody who is providing the platform that other people are speaking through. And it's written very broadly. It doesn't even require being connected to the internet because remember Prodigy and AOL for a while weren't even connected to the internet. Um, this is who is providing the online service. Um, that's important. But think for simplicity, it's the platform. The information content provider is whoever has created the content in question, uh, either the good content or the dumbass illegal content. The information content provider is the party who produced it. So now we get to the crux of things. This is the magic of the law and a very, it looks weird as legalese, but it's a very simple sentence that boils down to something really basic and really simple, which is whoever produced the dumbass content or the good content is responsible for it, not the platform that allowed them to communicate it. This is important. This means you can go after whoever created the expression, but you can't go after the platform. They're not liable. It's not theirs. Um, this simple sentence, more or less simple, it's legalese, uh, is why we have the internet. Because this gives platforms the ability to not be on the hook for all that user content. Um, it means they don't have to review all of it. Uh, it does that impossible task of trying to do it, and not just to see all the content, but evaluate the content for all the myriad reasons that, that the content could potentially be illegal. Um, it immuni immunizes them from having to do that impossible task. You can still go after whoever created the thing that's offending, wrong, illegal, or terrible in some other way, but not the platform. And this has allowed platforms to exist to be capitalized, to go into business, and to be available to broker all the speech and services that we've grown to know and love um, over the last 20 some odd years. There's also a second part. So remember, Congress wanted two things, the most good stuff and the least bad stuff. At C1, just to go back a second, because the platforms don't have to monitor all that content, it also means that they're free to let more content be up. They don't have to err conservatively about, oh my gosh, is this bad, is this wrong? Um, they can be generous to their users and allow more of the expression to remain. The users may still get in trouble for it, but they won't. And that means that you don't see a lot of unnecessary anticipatory censorship because the platforms are not so terrified that they need to make that choice. But sometimes we'd like them to make that choice. So there's also a section at C2, which says, okay, so now platforms are actually immunized in two ways. Um, you don't have to get in trouble for what stuff you leave up on your platform, but C2 means you also don't get in trouble for what you take down. Congress wanted to partner with the platforms and put platforms in the position to say, our objective to get most good stuff and the least bad stuff, let's get you on board and help us do that. And so this section at C2 helps the platforms do it because it means that if they do take things down, they also can't get in trouble of somebody complaining, how dare you take things down. Um, you also have some First Amendment protections for a platform to make those decisions, but it's really nice to have that's expressed in the statute. So ultimately what we have is an all carrot approach to what Congress wanted. The most good stuff, least bad stuff. We have incentivized the platforms to be a partner in helping achieve that. Whereas if platforms had to fear liability, it would start to skew their behavior because they would act in a more self-defensive, reactive way. And that's not necessarily consistent with being the best partner to making sure we get the most good stuff and the least bad. So our next slide. Um, they did write a couple of exceptions into Section 230. Um, this one we are mostly going to skip over. Um, 
they frame this not they frame this as limit I think I wrote exceptions. I don't think that's the way it is in the statute. They they refer to it in the statute as this is the way Section 230 will interact with other law. Um, there's something called the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986. They thought there might be a collision. So this is basically the thing to say, no collision, you're all fine. And this doesn't really come up. This does come up. Um, if the thing wrong with the user content is that it infringes somebody's intellectual property, then Section 230 is of no use to the platforms. Now, effectively, there's some other protection because we get to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and its system of notice and takedown. So platforms still have some protection, but what we see with the DMCA is it's very imperfect protection. You tend to hear a lot of stories about something being taken down for no good reason. And the reason that can happen is because the protection for the platforms is not nearly as good, so they're forced to take more proactive censoring uh, tacts towards a lot of their user content. So it's not great to put a hole in Section 230, and we've been suffering with that hole for a while, but mostly getting it off to the side to intellectual property. And with everything else, we've mostly been good to go. This is also important. This is state law. So the internet, it's everywhere. It crosses state borders. If you post on your website, you don't know where people are when they're going to read the content on your website. This makes a lot of sense to leave up to the federal government to say, look, this is crossing all sorts of state lines. So Congress is going to speak and articulate what national policy is. Because if any particular local jurisdiction could change the rules and say, hey, platform, turns out you're going to be liable if this user's speech happens to violate XYZ law. They've now decided it effectively for every other, every platform that's everywhere um, because it's really hard for a platform to react and to react in a way that's specific to a local jurisdiction. So Congress didn't want to mess with that. Congress is like, states, you're out of the business. I know you think that it's bad that um, like defamation law tends to be a creature of state law. So, you know, a state could be like, I really hate that our speakers are getting defamed defamed or people are getting defamed. We'd really like to hold the platforms liable. They don't get to change their defamation law to make that happen. There's reasons why we've exempted the platforms from liability. And if they start cutting holes in this, we'll mess up that whole project. Um, and then this has always been baked into Section 230 from the very beginning. There's another exception, which is if the thing wrong with the user content is that it violated federal criminal law, no immunity for the platforms. So this has meant that platforms have still been on the hook to do certain types of monitoring. But realistically, what are they looking for? They're looking for child porn. They're looking for things that were explicitly crimes under federal criminal law, uh, which tends to be a lot of the more onerous sexual type um, behaviors that are criminalized at that level. It's not great to put a monitoring burden on a platform, but this is just one burden. It means that platforms can use their resources most efficiently and they're not going to get diluted between all sorts of tasks of look for this, look for that, look for the other thing. Um, it means, okay, we put one burden on them and this is easier for platforms to meet. It also seemed to be take care of everything. You can put the most problematic criminal behaviors in the federal criminal law. We were fine. We didn't need to change this. This could go after a lot of things, but what people were upset about is it didn't tend to go after Backpage because the case could not be made that the, that the content that Backpage was dealing with was at its own creation. Now, eventually, Backpage actually started to lose, and there did start to be some federal criminal prosecutions. When that site went offline, it went offline not because of the changes that FOSTA brought to Section 230. It went offline because somebody decided we could prove that the problematic content on Facebook, uh, on Backpage, was really generated by Backpage. If that's true, they never had benefit of Section 230. The question we always had was whether that was true or not. But to the extent that you could prove it, no 230 protection for them. But we went ahead and messed up Section 230 anyway. And here we are with the impact of FOSTA. So I just want to back up. I don't have a slide on this, but um, we've been calling it SESTA. We've been calling it FOSTA. And I have a, one of the things I do is I'm a contributor on TechDirt. And um, last year, I think I wrote a post saying, which one should we be calling it? 
because when this was all brewing, we were calling it SESTA because SESTA was the first volley of people trying to push for these sorts of changes. SESTA was sitting out there percolating in the Senate when a bunch of people decided to come up with a answer bill in the House. Um, I didn't think this was the greatest legislative strategy, but the thinking was, okay, SESTA was terrible, but maybe we could propose a less terrible version in the House, and maybe that one would end up passing, and then we would get something, all right, babe, the devil we know better than the devil we don't. Um, so then there was a bill in the House called FOSTA. But what ultimately ended up happening is something got way out of control. The two bills glued themselves together in terms of their terms and impact, rolled up into a House version called FOSTA that got passed in the House. And then the Senate, basically, in order to make this thing go ahead and end up on the books, um, just did a companion bill that looked identical. So SESTA isn't the law that we're dealing with. The monster, the Frankenstein monster that we've had to cope with is one called FOSTA. So I know that everybody on their slides have said SESTA FOSTA because all the, all the policy debates about it were mostly under SESTA, but the law that got passed is FOSTA. So I tend to call it FOSTA because as we start to litigate this, we're litigating FOSTA because that's the law that is ruining everybody's day. Um, and one of the things it did is it stuck in this extra um, exception that was unnecessary because we already had an exemption for federal criminal law. But you can see with these blue hyperlinks, as it ping pongs us around through other aspects of the statutory code, um, it dovetails with other um, other forms of criminal liability. It also changed the definitions of what comprised that criminal liability. Um, and it's hard to explain exactly how. Um, we're now having litigation, which we've referred to before, the Woodhull Freedom Foundation versus United States. This is the constitutional challenge to the changes that FOSTA has brought. Um, and the problem is, is the district court said, I don't see the problem. All these plaintiffs, we had some plaintiffs who were sex advocates. We had some plaintiffs who, um, who had been censored. We had pl plaintiffs who were um, platforms, um, all sorts of different plaintiffs who are all like, this has either affected us or is going to affect us our, and our ability to speak or intermediate completely lawful speech. And the district court is like, I don't see it. I, you're fine. This hasn't affected you. It'll never affect you. And they read all this weird ping pong parsing throughout the statute just saying it's just not going to bother you. Um, so this has been appealed. Um, we are now at the D.C. Circuit, and briefs are starting to go in from both the government and also the plaintiffs and also a lot of amicus briefs. Prostasia had done a, an amicus brief. Um, I filed an amicus brief on behalf of startups and other small platforms. Um, and there, we're kind of, that side is saying, what do you mean that there's no problem here? Um, the DOJ was like, nope, the district court was right. Nothing to see here. Go away. This is fine. Nobody's been hurt. Nobody will ever be hurt. And the other side is saying, what are you talking about? This is terrifying. We've already been hurt, and we will definitely be hurt. And one of the ways that we point to it is there was an amicus brief on the side of the government where 21 state attorney generals showed up and said, FOSTA is so awesome, and we can't wait till we get to go use it against all these people in our jurisdiction that we want to go use it. Um, and I kind of noted in a tech dirt post, one of these is Florida, which was at the last Super Bowl really very happy to announce how they had broken up the sex trafficking uh, endeavor um, oh, what, it's somewhere in Palm Beach, which turned out there was no sex trafficking. It was, there was prostitution, arguably, but it was, but it was more run-of-the-mill prostitution, not, not something where you had had the trafficking and the exploitation. Um, so you have these 21 states that showed up to argue, we can't wait to get this wrong again. Um, and I think it's an interesting way to present itself to the court that if the U.S. government is trying to say, no problems here, this, will, this statute will never parse out in a way that will hurt a platform, um, I think it calls into question whether that's the appropriate view. The problem with where we are right now is we don't really know. Um, in terms of considerations, one of the things I think we're trying to do today is help think through you know, you've got your business, you you either know what you're expressing, you know what your business is doing, you know who you're trying to take care of, and there's questions about 
what's your best guess on the read and how much legal risk can you tempt and, and tolerate or need to try to do anyway? Because otherwise, if you read this in certain ways, it might be game over for an awful lot of people in the room and maybe that's not the decision we wanna make right now. Um, but this all depends. That's why I can't give legal advice because your situation, your mileage will vary tremendously. Um, but we are in this little weird bit of, we know what the statute says literally, but we don't know what it means effectively. Um, I think we might need to see how this Woodhull litigation plays out and then we'll know a lot more, but it will take some time for that to happen. This case is still being briefed um, and I don't think we're gonna have oral argument until the fall. So the first possible way we're gonna hear anything might be the fall at the earliest and we're probably looking at at least the winter. So stay tuned and we'll talk later. Okay, I'm Kristen D'Angelo and I'm the Executive Director of the Sex Workers Outreach Project Sacramento. I also identify as somebody who's worked in the sex trade for over four decades. That means 40 years of experience. It also tells you I'm an old rod or I wouldn't be saying that. On top of that, I am a survivor of what we now call human trafficking. I spent almost 10 years of my life without control of my actions and what happened. So when I talk about sex work, when I talk about human trafficking, I consider myself an expert on both, not because I've studied the subject, but because I've lived it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, how do we move to the next slide? Oh, arrows. Yeah. Got it. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you some basic definitions. A lot of people have done that here today, and I do that to make sure when I'm speaking, that you're hearing what I'm saying, that you understand exactly what I'm talking about. So when I talk about the term sex work, okay, that is a term that is um, grounded in labor rights. It has to do with us having our consent and volition over our own bodies. It means that nobody else is forcing us, nobody's making us, it is a choice. Sex work, unlike what most people think, the I want to say the majority of forms of sex work in the U.S. are legal. Okay, so when I say sex work, I'm talking about cam girls. I'm talking about strippers. I'm talking about people engaged in porn. I'm talking about um, phone sex operators. I'm also talking about people engaged in prostitution and, and gray areas like escorting um, and massage. When I say massage, because even though people go, oh, there's a big difference between therapeutic massage and erotic massage, we all get the same license as you guys. So massage, and I'll cross the board. Um, this term was coined by Carol Lay, the Scarlet Harlot here, a friend of mine here in San Francisco, and it is used internationally as the PC term. So I put that out there so when you guys are speaking about us, you understand when we talk about prostitution, that is a legal definition that none of us like, the PC term now is sex work. That is opposed to human trafficking, okay? Two different things. Everybody in this category is over 18 years of age. They are consensual. They are choosing to do what they're doing. What I tell people is this is my body and my right. After losing 10 years of my life, nobody, no one, not even lawmakers, are going to tell me what to do with my body or negotiate the terms under which I have sex, as long as it's with a consenting adult. You get what I'm saying? Human trafficking is very different. That is a term defined by our federal government. And according to the TVP, it's really TVPRA Act because they revise that act now, but according to the TVPA Act, it has to do with certain things. I'm going to break that down real easy for you. It has to do with force, fraud, and coercion. You have no choice. You don't want to be doing it. You have been forced somehow. You don't get to live off of the proceeds of your earnings. Somebody else is taking them, and your life is hell. From standing in both positions, I can tell you they are night and day. Trafficking is a labor violation. If you look at it that way, you'll see it differently. In any other labor industry, any other labor industry, before there was protection under the law, there were people who were trafficked and forced and made to do things. There was labor exploitation and even of children. So when I frame it to you that way, if we're gonna solve human trafficking in the sex trafficking arena, 
We have to do it like we did in other, in other areas, such as farm labor, you know, domestic labor. Think of it that way. Same thing. This is a job. This is a labor industry. This isn't a sexual proclivity. I'm not going to work unless somebody pays me. You know, it's a job. It's a job. When we talk about human trafficking, there's one caveat. So when you read all these things in the newspaper and all the things they're telling you, and I'll tell you what that one caveat is, if you are under 18 years of age, under 18 years of age, it doesn't matter if you're a runaway, you are choosing to do it, you have no parent to sign for you to get a job, it, do, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are, you are automatically a human trafficking victim. So when you read the headlines and they say, oh, we rescued 32 human trafficking victims across the United States in this week, you never get that high. Let's say 13. That's even high. 12. <laughs> I'm pushing it because they never really get that many. If you look at it, the majority of them are minors who run away from foster care systems, minors, that, et cetera, et cetera. There are some people who do fit that definition, the federal definition of human trafficking. However, the way we address it today is very, very hard to change things. In fact, the way we're addressing today, you never will change things because you are silencing the people who you need to be listening to. We are your front, first line of defense. If you do not hear us, this will continue. Okay, um, I have to do the next one. There we go. I am going to give you a third category. And I'm going to give you a third category because if we ignore this category, we are ignoring what is going on. The largest, the largest population of sex workers in the United States are those engaging in survival sex. What does that mean? They are people who are otherwise, and it doesn't have to be homeless, they cannot survive unless they exchange sex for something in return. That can be housing. That is illegal, you guys. That can be food. That is illegal. I want you to understand this. This is illegal. A person in the United States will be arrested if they are starving and they agree to have sex for food. You are still a criminal now. You are allowed to die, but you're not allowed to eat. I want you to understand that. When I talk about survival sex, we did, my organization did a needs analysis of the Sacramento Valley. And we we um, interviewed 44 sex workers, and we had an IRB certified researcher working with us, and so we went down to one street. That is not a big sample size if you look statewide, citywide, countrywide, no. But if you're talking about one street, 44 sex workers on one street is a pretty good sample size. Out of them, we found the majority of them were out there because there weren't enough services available. When I said available, they may have been there, but they didn't have easy access. They didn't have identification. They had no way to get to them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 80% um, of them identified as being homeless or in transient housing. Each day, they didn't know if they would have a roof over their head. 59% reported being raped. 55% reported beatings. 27% um, reported being harmed by a sex worker, I mean, by a, uh, an officer. So we saw a very, very large survival sex population. Um, and one of the things we saw, and this is where te technology, when we did this, we, when we did this research, we did it after a site called SF Redbook got taken down. SF Redbook was before Boston SESTA was one of the federal government's first attempts at this kind of um, legislation. Like, what could they do? How could they get us off the internet? And when I get to the next slide, you'll understand what I mean by that. So when they took it down, SF Redbook, we went out there to do this research because I wanted to see what the effect was. What we found is we found 18% of the people now working in street prostitution have been on the internet. What we found out of this 18%, almost every one of them had encountered violence since that site had dropped. The internet was a support service. It was a support service. It was their lifeline. When they lost that, they lost the ability to work. When you lose your job, you are now in a more vulnerable position. And what we found out that 18%, the majority of them had encountered traffickers since they'd been out there and had never met them before. The majority of them had encountered exploiters and almost every one of them had been raped or, or had their money stolen back. I mean, it was just like a bloodbath of stories. 
Okay. Websites which allow transitioning for us off the streets, and I can speak to that because I was a baby on the streets, were life-saving. The stories I hear from the young girls today who never had to work and go through what I did, their experience, if they worked on the internet, is so much safer. It's so much safer. They haven't experienced the violence that we have. So, criminalization will never stop a person from surviving. This is a job. This is a mechanism for survival. It is unreasonable to think they will stop eating if they're arrested. That's just not going to happen. The rest does nothing to help us. So, what I think internet companies should know, okay, for me, the internet was a blessing. And I can't even not tell you how much the internet was a blessing. I have been a witness in a prosecution where the man had kidnapped me and held me captive. I have been raped numerous times. I've been trafficked. I can tell you it was life-saving because for the first time, I didn't have to have an intermediary or someone out there protecting me. For the first time, I had control. I could sit behind my computer and decide who I wanted to see in a safe way. So what I think I need to tell people who work at internet companies, listen to us. We are some of your best allies in the fight against human trafficking. Okay, we've been talking a lot about SESTA in Boston, that's what that is, and yet our voices were silenced. I had a letter there at the Senate hearing, okay? The senator stand, sitting up in front said, yeah, I just can't believe that. I just can't believe that. Last year was one of our deadliest years. In the United States, over 200 sex workers were murdered. Over 200. And the majority of them were people of color, Mar our marginalized population and trans population. We had a bloodbath here in the United States, courtesy of Boston and Sesta. Listen to us. Understand our history. The internet gave rise to the independent sex worker. Craigslist, when the rod exception went up on there, 70% drop in female homicide. And that was a study done by the West Virginia University and Baylor University. 17% drop. They would wish any law would give a 17% drop in female homicide or any homicide. Yeah, all that's gone. All of that's gone. I already talked to you about SF Red Book and Backpage. People think that these sites and the internet causes human trafficking. When they say that, oh my god, no that doesn't. If you want to get to the roots of human trafficking, we need to talk about marginalization. We need to talk about imperfect foster care systems. We need to talk about drug treatment centers. We need to talk about a lot of things because it is the marginalized person who is the most, most vulnerable to becoming a trafficking victim, okay? We don't need to talk about it after it happens. Yeah, we do, but I mean, if we talk about it before, that's so much more powerful, so much more powerful. I have a group of friends. We've all been through the same thing. You know, we didn't have a word for it back then when this was happening to us. And all of us sit there and look at what's going on. And what we know is that if you guys listen to us, we could really make a difference. But this legislation that you're doing, you're just killing people. And that includes trafficking victims. They're dying too because now they're in a more marginalized position. Okay, so you guys aren't the problem. We fought this fight so you know when it was in print material. We've gone through this in print material prior to the internet. I've been through that. Prior to that, they were they were legislating the massage parlors. I've been through that. I worked in the brothels in the first years they were open. The feds used to raid those. They still do. It's an insane world, but nobody stops to have the conversation. Internet companies save us. They keep people alive, and some of the most marginalized people that need your support. Um, so, what happens to trafficking victims when their life lines and support services are pulled? So, you know, my organization deals with human trafficking victims all, every day. I mean, this is what we do. We have a hotline, we're on the stroll, we go to them with court and try to get their cases expunged because most of them are arrested, you know, unlike what people think. This is what we do. 
Okay, so what happens when they're cold? One of these young girls that I was working with recently, amazing, amazing woman who was working in the healthcare industry and ended up becoming a trafficking victim. Her pimp was putting her, and I'm gonna use pimp, and not all pimps are traffickers, so please, I can explain that, but I don't wanna go into details, it's too long-winded. Her, her trafficker was um, forcing her to put up an ad on back page. So yes, it did happen. But that day, she was in a car. She was headed to San Jose with him. He had a hotel room for her. She got on the internet, and guess what? There was that big federal sign, the FBI, the CIA, the IRS, you know, it's been seized in that notice. And she was like, oh my God, oh my God. Now, that was of no concern to him. He was still gonna make his money, right? It was only of a concern to her. That was her first night on a street corner. Within the next seven months, I, she could tell me stories of having guns held to her head while she was being robbed. Being ra oh, worst part is after she got robbed, she went back and she got beaten by her trafficker because she lost the money, right? This is what her life became. She lost all security. So when people think like, yay, we took these pages now, we helped. The trafficking victims I knew, their life spiraled out of control and got worse fast. Fast. She was arrested seven times within the next six months, and she still hasn't even been able to get those records vacated. The last one we got dropped in the interest of justice. The other ones, she will never work in a hospital again. She will never work in, in medical care, which she was working in. She will never work in schools. She will never work in for the state, city, the county. She will never work because she was a trafficking victim. Okay? But what I want you to hear is her life got worse once that happened. The other thing I want to tell you is conflation um, kills. Sesta and Basta conflated prostitution with human trafficking. That law has nothing to do with human trafficking. It was a huge conflation of the two. They talk about facilitating prostitution in that law. That is not anything about what goes on. You guys, if you are responsible, you know, for, for keeping your website safe and not having traffic on, on, this puts you in a bad position because you're now liable for things that you weren't before. I get it. I get it. But one of the things you can do is you can help us fight against this because I really, really believe that this law has more to do with censorship and control of what adults do with their body then it has anything, anything to do with human trafficking. If you want to stop human trafficking, come talk to us. We can tell you what you're doing wrong. Okay, so that's, I think, all I had to say. I know, I'm, I'm loud. Yep, that was it. I'm all right. Thank you.